Commissioner Young, if you'd like to get started for us today. Uh, are you, yes, are you gonna advance the slide? Um, good afternoon. This, I am uh, Loretta Young. I'm a commissioner in Family Court, State of Delaware. I'm a board member with NUAP and a member presenter with the um, National Judicial Network. So who is the Judicial National Network? We are state and tribal court judges, commissioners and magistrates, court officials, administrative staff, judicial educational professionals, and we are committed to the effective adjudication of cases involving immigration and human trafficking victims. We're focused on providing training and developing resources to support judges and judicial officers who encounter litigants in state or tribal courts who are potential human trafficking victims or and uh, immigrant crime victims. The webpage for this webinar has already been created and can be accessed at this link. Please remember to complete the evaluation at the end of the webinar. And uh, Daniela is also putting the links in the chat box. All the webinars are recorded and you can review them shortly after the session date on the webinar's webpage. And we'll also send a link by email to the registrants and participants. Our upcoming webinar is on July 5th, same time, and that is on missing and murdered Indigenous women and the intersection with trafficking. And with that, I yield my virtual floor to Judge Mack. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Barbara Mack. I'm a retired judge from Seattle, Washington. I serve on the board of the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, and I do a lot of training on human trafficking, in particular child sex trafficking. As a juvenile court judge, I was stunned to learn that there are parents and families that sell their own children. I could not wrap my brain around it, and I found that many judges have the same problem. So I started looking for research on familial trafficking. Back then, there wasn't a lot. Thanks to Dr. Ginny Sprang, there is now. Dr. Sprang is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Kentucky. Uh, she's executive director of the Center on Trauma and Children. She's the principal investigator on multiple federal and state grants that examine child traumatic stress, treatment, uh, treatment effectiveness, and best practices for trauma survivors. She's on the steering committee of the National Child Traumatic... <laughs> I'm gonna do that again, National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Uh, and I, I could go on and on about Dr. Sprang, but then she wouldn't have any time to talk. For our purposes, she wrote the definitive academic study of familial sex trafficking of minors, published in 2018, and I cite it regularly in all of my trainings on domestic child sex trafficking. Uh, this is not just a domestic child sex trafficking issue, it's a worldwide issue, but we see it more and more here. Through her work and new data from the Counter Trafficking Data Collaborative, <coughs> NICMIC, Polaris, and other organizations, we now know that as many as half of tra child trafficking victims are first trafficked by their own family members or caregivers, legal guardians. I am pleased and honored to introduce Dr. Sprang with gratitude for her work, Dr. Sprang. Thank you, Barbara. I'm very happy to be here. I'm gonna take just a minute to share my screen. Um, so let me pull up my slides. <clears throat> And if you guys could just give me a thumbs up if you see them. All right, great. All right, well, um, so I'm really happy to be here and um, share um, a little bit about familial sex trafficking. Um, when I agreed to do this, um, I realized that I needed to take another deep dive into the literature because so much is coming out. So this presentation gave me the opportunity to kind of read a lot of uh, things that had just come out. 
So while um, I am, uh, you know, very honored uh, for you to call that paper, um, you know, the the kind of sentinel piece, I will say um, that there is a lot of good research that is now emerging. And um, I'm approaching this presentation primarily as a researcher. That's um, the majority of my perspective on familial sex trafficking, but I am the center director um, for Translational Research Center, the Center on Trauma and Children. And in that center, I have two clinical labs. One is a forensic assessment lab where we do child welfare, um, very comprehensive risk assessments. And the other is a federally funded trauma treatment clinic. And in both of those labs, we see uh, uh, sex trafficking victims. The majority of those cases um, in my setting are familial sex trafficking. So um, as we get started, um, I just wanted to acknowledge a few funding sources. I am citing everyone um, that has done work, and I'm <clears throat> am using a lot of different research in this presentation, but I did want to specifically mention some work that I had done for the National Institute of Justice. Um, this is a study I did with my colleague, Jennifer Cole, um, and we looked at the impact of safe harbor laws um, and how those were impacting the way cases of sex trafficking of minors were matriculating through the system by different systems of care. And a portion of that um, included interviews um, with a lot of judges about what they were seeing, how they were identifying it, what they needed um, to address these cases. And probably many of you on, um, on the Zoom call today um, may have participated in, in some of those interviews. Um, also have a, a, a study right now that was recently funded by the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, this is a randomized controlled trial of a bystander intervention to address child sex trafficking. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that and, and some data uh, as I go through. And then also some SAMHSA funding that funds my uh, trauma treatment center where we have a uh, child trauma study going where we look um, at child sex trafficking as a subset of the trauma cases that come in. So those are our three projects that kind of funded um, the, the work that I'm talking about today that I'm very appreciative of. Um, so, you know, as we start off, we know that um, it's really hard to get a handle on the prevalence of familial sex trafficking. Um, there are many cases that go undetected. I know in my state, um, for those children who are um, trafficked in familial types of settings, quite often these cases are showing up in uh, family court as neglect cases, maybe sexual abuse cases, um, but very rarely are they being identified um, as familial sex trafficking cases. Um, in fact, when we did our interview, uh, with many of the family court judges, um, they were really not thinking of some of the things they were seeing um, in their courtrooms as uh, sex trafficking until we read the definition. And then they realized that there was both exploitation and trafficking occurring. Um, and we know that uh, many of the databases are not making that distinction um, as well. So when we try to pull out uh, familial sex trafficking rights. Um, I think they're crude estimates at best. Um, but like, for example, if you look at the stop at the traffic, stop the trafficking.org website, they have like um, seven major forms of human trafficking and uh, sex trafficking is one of those. And then under sex trafficking, there are like 11 categories and familial sex trafficking isn't even listed. Um, even though we have ample uh, evidence in the literature that this type of um, uh, exploitation and trafficking in a family um, is a severe violation of trust that violates a, um, you know, our assumptions of intimacy and control and powerlessness and 
all of those things that we learn early on in childhood about how people should relate to each other, how adults and child should relate to one another, what one can expect of the world, how worthy of benevolence we think we are, and um, that can color a child's entire life. In fact, we see, if you look at the definition of complex trauma and the disruptions and systems of meaning associated with complex trauma, familial sex trafficking, you know, meets the de definition of exposure for sure in those cases. And we're starting to see the, the profile of victims going forward as being uh, very much um, kind of in that complex trauma domain. Um, we know that um, uh, the 2019 report from the U.S. National Human Trafficking Out Hotline reported that familial sex trafficking was the second most common reason um, that uh, children and youth got induced into commercial sex. Um, and we also know that we have, this has been on our radar um, for quite some time, at least two decades. In 2005, the National Juvenile prostitution study was documenting um, that about 12% of youth in that particular study um, were exploited by a family member. And in, in the way we were thinking about it in 2005 is that familial sex trafficking was a subcategory under child sexual abuse with payment. So it was kind of buried deep down in those definitions. Um, we're also starting, you know, about that time we started to see the different states started to uh, report familial sex trafficking cases, and we have wide variation in the state level numbers, and that's based on, um, you know, how they're classifying cases and, and detection, but we see like 19%, a rate of 19% in South Carolina, 25% in Hawaii, and then between 45 and 47% in Minnesota and Kentucky, uh, respectively. Um, uh, and um, in 2007 to 2012, this hotline um, really was kind of where we went to for a lot of our information. And we did see that uh, the National Human Trafficking Center's hotline was reporting then about 16%. Uh, of youth were trafficked by a parent um, or legal guardian. Um, and then in 2021, the Institute of Medicine's Counter Trafficking Data Collaborative was reporting around 25% of youth sexually exploited um, by a family member. And then more recently, um, the Polaris Project was reporting about 31% of youth um, were trafficked by a a family member. And I think this is evidence not only that we're getting better at detection, um, but rates are also rising. This was a, this 31% was like a 47% increase over 2019. So we were, you know, I think we're seeing two things happening. Um, I think with um, some of the opioid crisis um, that's kind of sweeping across certain sections of the US um, that certainly has increased rates in my own state, but I think we also are seeing just we're getting better at awareness and detection, which is why we're seeing um, these numbers rise. But again, these are crude estimates and we know that the rates are actually much higher um, than that. So wanted to talk a little bit about the context of familial sex trafficking because I was like Judge Mack. You know, when I first, when we first started seeing these cases, I was like, you know, this is a new low, um, you know, what do we, what do we need to know about these cases to really understand what's happening in these families? Um, and so we now have, I would say about three or four years of, of some pretty good data coming out about uh, a profile of um, kind of a family where sex trafficking happens. We're starting to see some convergence across studies, which is good. And the first is that these victims tend to be younger. Um, if you look across studies, we're seeing the average age falling between 11 and 12 years old. 
um, which is um, much younger than the estimates you see in just the general child sex trafficking literature where you see averages falling between 14 and 17 years of age. And so um, across the country, I think um, there's lots of evidence that we're starting to have some good programming um, and education um, that's occurring in high schools. But this, some of these consistent findings about these family sex trafficking victims being younger was something that really prompted us to, to write this CDC study to do this randomized control of this bystander intervention, which we are placing in middle schools because this is where we feel like we need to get to kids, where we need um, you know, increased surveillance of some of these circumstances so we can catch these earlier. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about um, that program um, as we go through. Uh, the most common uh, perpetrator in familial sex trafficking seems to consistently be the biological mother. Uh, about 61% of the time in the ALERT study, about 64% in my 2018 study. But most of the time there's a paramour or an acquaintance of the mother that's also involved in the trafficking. And that's between 40 and 44% of the time. Uh, it's not that biological fathers are not involved. They are about a third of the time, um, but it tends to be the biological mother that's identified as the primary perpetrator. And quite often the fathers are actually missing from the home completely. There was a study um, that was by Laughlin in 2021 um, that stated that much of the time, these biological mothers were also uh, sex trafficked as children. Um, and so we had a recent case, uh, I know in my center, where we had a young child younger than this average age that I mentioned to you who was trafficked by her mother and grandfather. And um, her mother was also trafficked as a young child around the age of 13, as were her sisters. And her grandmother was also sold online to a man in another state in exchange for drugs. So this was definitely one of those examples of intergenerational transmission and I think this really suggests that um, there's been this kind of narrative shift in these families where the caregiver's working model of their children has been really distorted and their ideas about protection and safety and intimacy have really been skewed and then handed down over the generations. Um, and uh, when we talk to these families, there's a general lack of awareness that this is atypical in a family. Um, it's not being identified um, as something that would be violent or abnormal or traumatic uh, for a child. So there's just a general lack of awareness, um, suggesting some opportunities to get to some of these families when intergenerational transmission is occurring and you know stop that cycle through education. Um, and I think the fact that, you know, you've got the biological mother as the primary trafficker, you know, I think that that does bring up um, some insight into the dynamics of, of these situations. You know, there is, it's pretty common for child victims to feel coerced by the perceived authority of the trafficker. But I think um, the nature of that authority is different in familial sex traffic cases and the parent's authority over the child, the attachment relationship, regardless how broken or distorted that it is, um, is persuasive enough to compel compliance, um, especially when the children are younger like this. Um, in terms of motive, um, across studies, um, if you look, the most common motive was financial in nature. Um, where the children were expected to contribute to the family economy in some way um, and um, substance abuse dependence of the caregiver was has been evident in roughly between 75 and 80 percent of cases reported in many of these published studies. So in the studies that I've conducted, 
a common report from service providers is um, they will say things to you like, I can't even think of one family sex trafficking cases where drugs were not um, the factor or impetus um, for the trafficking. Um, and that certainly seems um, to be true in those areas of our state that are struggling the most with the opioid um, epidemic. Um, in terms of venue, um, in almost 50% of these family sex trafficking cases, um, we see that children are being trafficked in the home with or without their parents being present. So everything from, you know, this happens, my mom's gone for periods of time and um, the traffickers are coming into the house. We also see uh, uh, case scenarios where um, the parents move the trafficker into the house um, and even allow the trafficker to, to sleep with their child in exchange for drugs, be the babysitter, um, or just turn over um, authority of their child to the trafficker who may also reside in the home or come and go. Um, other you know, common forms um, include online uh, exploitation. Um, and in 2020, the, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children reported there was like almost 100% increase, 98.6 or something like that of children um, disclosing that they had been trafficked through online um, solicitation. And that's compared to the same time pre-COVID. So we see that COVID has really kind of increased vulnerability because kids have more access to the internet. In fact, I even read a situation where there was um, a group of, of um, defense attorneys that were coming together um, to advocate for um, sex offenders who had had access to the internet um, prohibited as part of their sentence, saying that they needed increased access because of COVID to get information to protect themselves. Um, and so I don't know uh, per se of any of those cases that were successful, but I know that there was a movement um, to try to, to um, get increased access. Um, there was also uh, evidence that children were transported to a buyer's location or transported to a hotel or motel or that the trafficking was uh, occurring um, in a vehicle. Um, so that's kind of some of the individual um, uh, level risk factors, but we know if we kind of, you know, zoom out and we take a socio socioeconomic and ecological perspective on family sex trafficking, that there are other risk factors at the relationship level, the community level, and the societal level. And um, I think if we consider the social ecology of family sex trafficking, um, there's notable consistency across the world. Poverty, social inequality, gender-based violence, and you know, just social determinants of health in general um, kind of act as the major drivers of trafficking, um, even in these familial sex trafficking groups. So that's just the, the consistent context that we're seeing. Um, but if I if we drill down just a little bit more, there's a couple of things I wanted to, to talk about on this list. Um, the first in, in a fam that has real particular application to familial sex trafficking is the idea of disrupted attachment. Sometimes this happens due to migration, to the incarceration of a parent, to the parent's substance dependence. Um, violence in the home, et cetera. But we do know that the attachment relationship um, in a child's life can be one of the most protective um, factors in preventing a traumatic stress response and PTSD longer, uh, later down in their development. Um, and this, dis this dis disrupted attachment 
um, really prevents a child from using their relationship with their caregiver as a way to deal with other types of things that are going on in their life, like being bullied, um, ostracized, um, you know, being um, subjected to community violence. So um, these disrupted attachments are not necessarily because of um, just um, the lack of physical proximity or the loss of a caregiver, that we do see, see children losing caregivers to opioid overdo overdoses and other types of violence. <clears throat> it also um, happens when you know, a parent is preoccupied with drugs or is so preoccupied with managing their own mental health symptoms that they really aren't able to engage in at attachment promoting behaviors. They're not able to be attuned to their child's needs. So this is a big one that we pay attention to um, in our clinics is um, where are the attachment disruptions? Where are the deficits and how can we begin to plug those holes? Um, we see limited education of caregivers as being a factor, and I'm talking not just about limited education, but also limited IQ. And many of these cases, the caregivers are kind of duped or um, are just very um, unaware and uninformed about um, exactly what kinds of things they're getting their kids into. Um, at the community level, um, of course, in those I've mentioned several times, you know, this opioid um, epidemic, which is now becoming a mixed opioid meth epidemic in my state, uh, where meth is going back up. Um, but when, when that's happening, a lot of that's happening in the family. You know, those are hot zones um, for commercial sex and children are left unattended. And so they're trafficked either intentionally or unintentionally because the parents are preoccupied some corruption of officials that's certainly happening in some of these uh, rural areas uh, where people are turning a blind eye um, and, and laws are not being enforced. Um, I do wanna talk about some of these societal level factors because sometimes we gloss over and we don't, uh, we think that's too big or we can't, that's not something within my purview. But this, um, this whole idea that um, you know men um, need to be strong and invulnerable uh, to sexual victimization uh, just because of their role in society um, sometimes prevents boys from being detected um, and keeps them from reaching out and help seeking due to, to fear of social ostracism or being perceived as weak or having their, their sexual orientation questioned. Um, and it may be that um, in many cases, boys are perceived as having more agency than girls. And so people don't automatically think, oh, they could uh, be, be vulnerable to something like this. Um, and they tend to look at girls as um, more likely to be uh, the offenders, prostitutes, rather than victims of exploitation. And I think it just also reflects the, you know, society's general uh, discomfort with the idea of men having sex uh, with other men causes uh, people to just not want to think about boys um, as victims of, of commercial sexual exploitation. And I think there's similar issues. Uh, we're starting to see lots of uh, emerging literature about the vulnerability of LGBTQ plus children and youth, um, they tend, in my opinion, to be ignored um, in a lot of academic discussions about child sex trafficking, um, yet they're um, you know, very much at risk for sexual exploitation, and they tend to be overrepresented in um, studies of homeless youth um, who are you know, very vulnerable as well. Um, and, you know, I always want to mention here um, the low recognition of child's rights. I know that is not something that um, is always um, something people would acknowledge, especially, you know, everybody on this call and interested in this topic has an affinity for the protection of child rights. But 
I certainly um, see in my community and in larger communities, just a general uh, dismissal of child's rights. And, um, you know, Bruce Perry writes beautifully um, about how, um, how we're, uh, we kind of, our laws are geared towards property owners and that children, you know, sometimes are still treated as the property of their, of their families. Um, and some of those um, kind of sentiments we, I see in my state in more rural areas where people really don't want anybody telling them what they can and can't do with their children and actually think it's you know, within their rights um, to traffic their kids. So I wanna kind of um, look at a clinical profile and response. You know, I'm a, I'm a therapist by training. This is, uh, you know, something that I've been very interested in. There is less information available, you know, empirical data about the clinical manifestations, but we, we do have enough now that we can kind of really point to this pathway between exposure and outcome. And so I kind of wanted to unpack this just a little bit for you. Um, if we think about the risk profile, we know that trauma history um, is a big player across studies, both in the general trauma literature and we're seeing in also the um, sex trafficking literature that prior exposure to a trauma, you know, makes someone vulnerable for a more troubled course. And so there's a lot of different reasons for this, but one that I think is particularly interesting that I'd like to mention is this idea of kindling. Um, Alexander McFarlane um, talks about this in the context of trauma exposure and talks about the idea that our trauma experiences um, are often um, not fully metabolized, even with treatment. And we know many kids don't get any treatment. They just go on with their lives. Um, and that it, it, the, it's this phenomenon that occurs where our functioning may improve somewhat. We may feel like we've coped with it. We've moved on. Um, we're doing better. And then we're exposed to something else. And all of a sudden, it's like um, there's a big blow up or escalation of symptoms. And I liken this to, you know, a, a burn, a, like a simmering ember at a campfire. You think you've put it out. Um, but it's still hot and a big, uh, you throw accelerant on it or there's a big gust of wind and you have this reactivation of the stress response um, that is very dysregulating to the child. Um, there's also a great body of literature now that shows us that parental mental health and PTSD is highly predictive of how a child um, will react. And um, in fact, you know, there's studies that I've done myself where we're seeing um, uh, that is the most robust predictor of a child's response is whether or not their parent had uh, mental illness or PTSD as well. Uh, we Children take their cues on how to respond. Um, and so we know that there could be both epigenetic and learned behavior and learned coping responses um, if we have um, a, a trauma history in a parent. And because there is this intergenerational transmission, um, we do know that um, in families that, that we have multiple family members that might have um, you know, impaired um, functioning or PTSD symptoms. There's also um, a fair amount of literature that shows that our peri, that a person's peri-traumatic response can dictate the course of their illness. So for example, if um, you are um, raped or if you are beaten up by your pimp and in that moment, you're very physiologically dysregulated and you dissociate and you have high intrusion. And if those symptoms are prolonged in the moment, in the first 72, hours to two weeks, we see those folks have a more troubled course over time. And so um, that's why it's really 
really important that we get to people and that we help them calm down and we help them become regulated because the longer they say dysregulated, dissociating, numbed out, it's more difficult for them um, over time to recover. So um, we know that that kind of peri-traumatic response is important. So it makes me think about what happens to a youth when um, you know a service system comes in, identifies them. You know what we're doing a lot of information. We're doing a lot of uh, we're expending efforts to 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 get information to get them to safety, but are we helping them regulate in such a way that we're dampening down that stress response enough so that they can have um, a less troubled recovery? Um, There's also issues related to the severity of exposure. So this is the more sensory images a person has, auditory, visual, tactile, olfactory, the degree to which they are um, inundated with witnessing, experiencing, hearing about these stories. Um, We see that as also a predictor of outcome. And then I did also, I've already mentioned the quality of the attachments in their life. If they've had a good quality attachment, if they have at least average IQ and reasonable social support, um, they tend to do a little better. We also know that following the exposure that um, the youth um, can have a high level of comorbid violence. So in many of the studies that you see out there, we see um, that folks are um, witnessing physical assaults. Um, So in my 2018 study, I think it was 58% were um, also physically assaulted. Um, And 26% of those had physical injuries that required medical attention. Uh, We're also uh, knowing that um, there's community violence uh, associated with this, a lot of fear, um, a lot of threats, not only to the youth, but to their family members, their siblings, that type of thing. So we have to pay attention to what's, what's existing comorbidly. Uh, with the with the trafficking experience. Um, and that could be before the trafficking experience as well as during um, while it's while it's occurring. Um, the co- these coping response is important here because that is usually activated <clears throat> right away. It could be adaptive, it could be maladaptive, but we do have evidence in the clinical literature of youth using substances, to dampen down their stress response um, in uh, about half of um, the youth um, in my 2018 study said that they had made a suicidal attempt in their life. Um, there's also evidence of non-suicidal uh, self-injury, um, cutting, self-mutilation, that type of thing. Um, and um, Castle is a, another author, author in, he wrote this article a long time ago in the New England uh, Journal of Mes- Medicine. And he said that s- the suffering that leads to suicidal behavior is often preceded by a threat to the person's existence or integrity or a- attempts to maintain his or her role in the family or society. And that usually these kinds of experiences or assault to the individual's sense of self or identity. And I thought this fit very well with the experience of familial sex trafficking. It's humiliating, it's demoralizing, it's a violation of trust. Um, And so I think um, that is why we're seeing um, higher rates of suicide attempts in these kids because um, it is the experience is overwhelming their capacity to cope and it is such a violation of their systems of meaning. Um, So there are at least two things I think we could take from some of these findings is that youth that are already compromised by living in households 
that are like modeling maladaptive coping. So in many of these situations, the family or caregiver also has maladaptive coping strategy. So that's what they've learned. Um, and this is just another opportunity in the pathway from exposure to distress, I think, if we can get in and teach coping skills to these kids early, which is why we wanted to get to the middle, middle school kids. Um, and I think this is a point of intervention here, like teach good coping skills early because they aren't learning it from their parents. And in the moment, it's such a big assault on their identity. It's hard for them to activate that unless it's learned a learned skill. So like when we teach kids these coping skills, we always say to them, it's it's like learning to play the piano or the violin or to be really good at a sport. If you want to learn how to downregulate using mindfulness or um, any type of these self-regulation strategies that we're teaching, you have to do it over and over and over. So there's some muscle memory so that when you're in the midst of something very overwhelming, you can call on that skill and use it. So we need to be getting to kids very young. Um, in terms of context, um, <clears throat> a really perplex perplexing uh, problem to me has to do with this ongoing exposure and the potential trauma reminders associated when the victim when the victim has to have ongoing exposure and contact with the perpetrator. So this is something that I saw um, in one of my studies, and it's because quite often these are young kids. They're in family court. These, these cases are being identified in family court. And um, before the goal is changed, there's still the goal um, to TPR, there's still in, you know, moving towards reunification. So there is still visitation happening. And um, one of the things we always try to, to tell people is like, it's diff very difficult for a child to recover um, from um, a traumatic event if they're still being activated and um, triggered um, by exposure to the person that, that initiated that or that was coercing them or was keeping it going. And so um, I think that is an, a problem for us to deal with and would love to hear you know, people's thoughts about that when we do Q&A. Um, and I understand that it, it's complicated. Um, and I think it was 61% of the kids in my study were having ongoing con uh, contact with their perpetrator, their trafficker. Um, we also see that kids are reporting to the emergency departments. Um, so children are going to the hospital emergency department with broken bones, sexually transmitted diseases, <clears throat> and other kinds of injuries that are occurring while they're being trafficked. So this is an opportunity for detection and getting kids um, to safety. And this is why my friend Jordan Greenbaum has really been working um, with other people on tools um, to, uh, that healthcare professionals can use to identify and screen um, kids for child sex trafficking uh, based on patterns of injury and risk profiles. Um, we also know there was a study done by Beck of medical providers, and there was a significant gap between knowledge and awareness um, and the need, um, the, the number of cases they're being presented with. Um, we also saw some high rates of truancy uh, noted across CIS studies, which means kids are only intermittently in school. Um, and so when they're there, uh, we need to be able to really be asking questions um, um, and looking very carefully for risk signs of sex trafficking. And then finally with symptoms, there's not that many studies that are looking at clinical outcomes um, in sex trafficking victims, but PTSD is the most common condition that's being reported with major depressive disorder next. And um, we're also seeing high symptom severity as uh, measured by the, the child behavior checklist. So um, for those of you that use the CBCL, you know that we're always looking 
um, for scores, uh, T scores over 63. And we see um, consistently that trafficked youth are reporting T scores are in the mid 70s, like around 74 to 78, um, with higher rates of arousal and dissociation in youth. Um, and that is compared to kids that have been sexually abused, but not trafficked. So it's, it's a harm over and above just the sexual violation. And um, finally, there was a, a really nice study um, here by Otisova, and um, it revealed that there were a high proportion of trafficked children uh, with PTSD that met, that met this, this criteria for complex PTSD. So just wanted to talk to you a little bit about like, what can we do about it? So it's not all about the problem. And there was um, some discussion of, um, of some solutions. Um, I think we're making some headway, but there's still a lot of work to be done here. Um, in terms of prevention, um, it felt like to me that this was um, a great opportunity to begin to apply some of what we have learned about bystander approaches like Green Dot, for example, um, where we're getting other people in the community and bystanders involved in the detection, the reporting, the delivery of services early to help kids. So that is the, the basis of our CDC grant. Um, we do see other prevention programs like training and technical assistance programs like HEAL that are trying to do a lot of education of providers, um, help people identify and screen um, early so that we can you know, find kids that are at risk and you know, stay with them. Um, and then certainly increase community surveillance in general. Um, and so I think all of these um, approaches are, are starting to um, have some evidence attached to them that's showing um, that it's leading to increased action. So with this bystander approach, for example, we're talking about um, you know, five big skills, deciding what to do, directing action, disrupting um, the trafficking, delegating to people that can help you, and then documenting what you've done. Those are like the five Ds that we're teaching people. Um, in terms of screening, um, there are these different kinds of tools out there that we're starting to, to use. And I think it takes all of these at different places and different levels to really um, get a handle on what's going on. You know, there are these um, <clears throat> indicator lists like the Iowa Department of Human Services is, use, using, is using. And, um, and with these screening tools, um, it's really not that just because there's a presence of an indicator, we should actually you know, assume it's trafficking, but it definitely means that we need further assessment. So these indicator lists are just like a, a checklist and um, things to look for. There's um, some indicator tools. Um, I've just developed one called the SITSI, See It to Stop It, and this is for school personnel. Um, and it is, I'm gonna show you a, a little piece of it in just a second. And then of course, there's the See It, the West from West Coast Children. Um, and many of these indicator tools um, have different levels of action associated with them. Um, and it's one of those actions is a full assessment and the interview tools like um, uh, the HTST and the trafficking victim identification tool by the Vera Institute are examples of like interviews that you would have with a child. Um, <clears throat> there's also some clinical um, interventions that I think are noteworthy. Of course, many of you probably know um, that trauma-focused CBT has been adapted um, to address the needs of trafficking victims. There's a, a couple of studies out that um, have some promising findings there. And you know, TFCBT is kind of the gold standard of trauma interventions. Um, there's also uh, skills training with a family component um, that's got some evidence attached to it. 
mentoring programs um, uh, like My Life, My Choice and uh, CPT, which is cognitive processing treatment, has been shown to be effective. Tracy Clemens did this study of CPT. She is one of my faculty at my center. Um, she did an adapted version for child sex trafficking victims. Now, those results looked pretty good there. And um, then, of course, we have um, the psychosocial and legal interventions. And I wanted to mention these professional society guidelines and standards, uh, the American Academy of, Academy of Pediatrics and the American Public Health Association have put some guidelines and standards in place. And while that seems very removed <clears throat> from the trenches, it really does begin to change the provider attitude and approach. Um, and I think it's really good that these professional organizations are stepping up and taking a, a stand. Of course, we have, um, <clears throat> we have the safe harbor laws, which um, have been rolled out in different variations across the country. And then the sex trafficking courts, which I have to tell you, I learned so much about when we were doing our judicial in, um, interviews, um, uh, doing really good specialized work, pulling resources together, you know, lots of different service providers coordinating, upping their game. Um, by coming together and really uh, through focused uh, attention um, to the problem. Um, so I think these are some of the things, you know, that uh, pays a lot that I think we should really pay attention to. This is the see it uh, to stop it indicator tool. And the way that this has, we have organized this is there are three tiers. So tier three means there's a clear concern. And this is a checklist we were asking middle school school personnel to use this um, tool and to check off if they based on what they know. So we have tried to put um, items here that we think, um, you know, a middle school staff might know some of it they might hear about some of it, they might be told some of it they might be suspicious of. But tier three is clear concern. Um, tier two um, is possible concern. And then tier one is continuing monitoring for emerging concerns. So if someone, for example, here um, endorsed any one of these items, um, then they would take direct action by reporting um, their concerns to the Kentucky uh, Department of Community-Based uh, Services. Um, they would provide immediate support to the youth they would pull the school mental health counselor in, so they would delegate for a full assessment, both of risk and mental health needs. Um, they would delegate um, to an external provider or the school mental health provider. Um, they would continue to monitor to make sure the situation is resolved, and then they would document um, so that we would have um, some evidence um, um, of what happened um, and uh, you know, all the details for reporting and that type of thing. And then tier two um, would have its own set of actions and tier one would have its own set of actions. And there is an intervention that goes with this that teaches them how to use the tool and how to identify these things. So it's like a whole package with the intervention and the screening tool. So, um, you know, this is my last slide, and I just want to kind of summarize by talking a little bit about what I think are some areas um, uh, that we, you know, really need to focus on that need more attention. Um, we know that children and youth um, that have been trafficked are 15 times more likely to have three or more missing child episodes. So we know that when kids are disappearing, when they're being truant from school, um, when um, you know they're spending the night away from home and they're 11 years old and you don't know where they are, um, that we need to be able to identify them and activate a, a system response. 
Um, we know that screening tools are usually for older kids and because we're seeing familial sex trafficking, you know, really happening in these younger age brackets. We need screening tools for young children. And I'm part of a group with Jordan Greenbaum that we're working on developing some tools now um, and uh, in language um, that uh, and in context um, that's appropriate for like the life and the interactions of a younger child. Um, we want to be able to separate sex and labor trafficking in our databases um, and to really be able to classify familial sex trafficking, have a category for it. Um, sometimes these are all lumped together and it makes it really difficult to understand prevalence and to really drill down into hot spots in the country where we really need to focus our efforts. Um, and then I, you know, really want us to think about the role that the pandemic has played in family sex trafficking. There's been increased social isolation, increased screen time, and more opportunities for coercive control. This makes intuitive sense to me. Um, but I don't know, it hasn't been established empirically, but I do think we do, there are these studies that are showing there's also increased violence um, in some families that have high poverty um, and are more isolated, more rural example. And then always we wanna think about the impact of this work on judicial personnel. Um, and because these cases can be um, I think uniquely distressing. There's a there's a helplessness. There's a lack of control you have as a provider. There's difficulty coordinating, um, and sometimes the youth themselves are so resistant um, to some of the interventions that you put in place. And so, um, you know, paying attention to secondary traumatic stress and countertransference. And that type of thing in judicial personnel is something that we want to keep an eye on as well. So um, I think I'm going to stop there and maybe we can do some Q&A, Barbara. I don't know if you have any comments or uh, anything you want to make first. Um, I don't have any particular comments. I do. Um... <clears throat> Based on my experience, which was a little while ago now, there were lots of different ways these families appear. Um, it may be that this has been the family business for generations. And, and, and I think that um, one of the things we miss, we talk about the missing kids and those, um, those uh, characteristics that we see in court, the behavior issues. But there is some evidence, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I have read that there is some evidence that some of these kids, because they want to keep their families intact, that is their social system, they present as rule followers in school, they do well, they engage in sports. Is that, is that your impression, Dr. Sprang? <clears throat> I, I think we see that some. I think the more common profile is that kids are sometimes just missing. Um, they tend to uh, you know, disappear for several days. They tend to disappear um, in, from like their communities um, completely for maybe a couple of months and then they reappear um, and nobody's looking for them. Um, it's happening kind of in isolation, parents, maybe they know where they are, maybe they have some inkling who they might be with. Um, but but this, this idea of being com looking compliant and being kind of with more quiet and not as oppositional or disruptive as maybe other kids, I have heard that a lot that they tend to maybe be a little more withdrawn. Um, you wouldn't know anything was going on other than, you know, they're, they're, they're just missing sometimes. Is, is that possible that it's a psychological, like a dissociation thing? I, I don't wanna think about it. I can't think about it. I'm gonna do everything I need to get by. <laughs> yes. Yes, and it's also about keeping secrets, you know. Um, <clears throat> it's all uh, 
They've been told to keep the secret, to not share with anyone, that if anybody finds out, you know, Child Protective Services is going to intervene and then it'll be worse. Um, or they may figure, you know, they may fear retaliation. So some of it is about keeping the secret and not wanting to get too close to anybody um, to share. And you, are there are there any questions from um, folks who have been watching this? I haven't seen questions in the chat box. I've been keeping my eye out. Um, <clears throat> there are. Um, I'll I'll ask one more uh, on my own, and that is, um, I try to keep track of what's happening around the country and. Um, I have, for example, an article from uh, South Carolina in 2019, so it was pre-pandemic, and the headline is, uh, the devil you know, South Carolina residents are selling family members into the sex trade. Is this happening everywhere? Is there anywhere it isn't happening? Is there, um, do, you, do you have any uh, information about that rural, urban, Anything? I, I really, I really couldn't answer that. I would guess that you know it's um, you know certainly there are pockets of the U.S. where it happens more. If there's a place where it never happens, I don't know. Um, but I, I would say that um, we did um, a study. A colleague of mine um, and I did a study, and we looked at. Um, rural um, versus urban providers. So we looked at like urban, um, micropolitan, and then metropolitan, uh, rural, my, metropolitan, micropolitan. So three different groups. And there was a real difference between um, knowledge, awareness, resources, capacity to screen, um, and then just general attitude about whether or not this is a problem or not between rural and metropolitan areas. So um, some of that's about, you know, physical isolation and some of it is about a little bit of denial that maybe this isn't really happening here. I heard that. I can't tell you how many times I heard that when we did the judicial interviews, you know, uh, people would say, well, I don't think it's a problem here. Um, and it probably isn't to the degree that it is in other places, but certainly um, there are cases in those areas. Um, so the kind of ratio um, is still there. The chat box is now lighting up. So I've got several questions for you. Um, I, I'm gonna ask you the first one, then I'm gonna go on to the second one. The first one is, is there a, two of them related. Uh, is there a role for faith leaders or faith communities in this situation? Then I'm going to go on to the second one, um, which is a judicial uh, question. If seeing a trafficking parent is a trigger for the child, how do I handle the fact that visitation between parent child is required by law? in cases with the goal of reunification, even if we take steps to suspend visitation, the child and parent may decide to see each other outside of scheduled visits in violation of the court order. Oh, okay, so two really good questions. So let me take the one about faith leaders first. I mean, absolutely, there's a role of faith leaders and you know, certainly we know across the country that many faith communities have kind of stepped out and taken the lead um, in some of these, pro these programs and initiatives. Um, you know, what I would say, and there's probably many answers to this question, Anne, but one of the things I would say is um, the church, are by, the church, the members of the church or the synagogue or the, um, the monastery, whatever, are always bystanders. They're community bystanders. They're part of the community. Things are happening in the community. And so I think some education of the community to be able to identify, to know what to do when they identify, to be able to take a non-judgmental stance um, towards um, these children and youth. 
um, and make sure that they're not shamed, um, you know, and that they're seen um, as children um, who can't give consent to this. Um, I think those are all things that church communities and faith communities can do um, in those situations. Um, and there's also resources that churches have. They take, um, you know, faith communities have these service initiatives in the community where they will do service projects and you know, they can channel their resources accordingly. Um, is, sorry, I thought you were done. Yeah, go ahead. That's linked to the next question. And, and I think um, we, this is a old story, we're having a problem with a 31-year-old man in a specific church grooming a 14-year-old and mom is having a problem because the church is covering. Uh, I mean, we've all read about issues with various denominations and it's not restricted to any particular one. Right. So I think that like any other community organization, you have to know who you're dealing with. What's your take on that, Dr. Sprang? I agree. I mean, I understand that um, that people sometimes are in have a dilemma about you know whose rights and who whose uh, you know morality am I protecting here? Um, you know, sometimes parents, you know, they're human beings and they need help and support and compassion and all that too. But uh, we have to remember that children are vulnerable, they lack power and agency, and we always have to secure them first. Um, and I think there needs, I would say this is a situation where that particular faith community needs some education, needs a little coaching and consultation from somebody who has authority um, to talk to them about, you know, what they can do to be helpful um, and um, maybe some of the dynamics of this and how they're not, uh, you know, violating their own values by also trying to protect this 14 year old. Um, but it is a tricky situation. People do a lot of mental gymnastics to, kind of rationalize some behavior that's hard to understand. And it's also complicated because frequently some adults blame the kids and um, that leads to covering up for an adult. And, and that's sort of a it's, a, it's a dynamic that exists in a lot of different realms, I, I believe. Um, so like I think we both said, you need to know who you're dealing with. And if faith leaders won't help, then um, I think that mom needs to find somebody who will support her child with her because that's the most important thing is supporting the child, uh, not discounting what the child says. Right. I think also I hear, and you've probably heard this too, as other people that have joined this webinar, Sometimes I, we hear this from teachers and other people in the community and they'll say things like this, look, you don't understand. This is just a bad kid. This is a bad kid. When I hear somebody say something like that, I instantly know that they don't understand the neurobiology of trauma. They don't understand what happens to our bodies when we um, um, are exposed to something like this when we are violated, um, when we're, uh, our parents um, betray us in such a way. And if you did understand the neurobiology, you would understand that it's not a choice that a child is making um, to be dysregulated or to be having um, you know, some pretty significant and toxic and noxious trauma symptoms that are interfering with their lives. So. It's like a little education and a little reframing of the problem and helping them understand it from a different perspective. Barbara, I would like to go back to the question that Julie um, had. Uh, That's what I was going to ask you to do. Yeah, because I, I, this is such a good one and I don't, I want to make sure that, you know, we talk about this and I'd like to hear other people's, like if they have good solutions too, but 
Um, yes, there. This is like where you know unintended consequences of a proposed of social policy. This is something that you know Robert Merton uh, talked about back in the '30s, where we do these things to make sure that we are you know, doing right by children and family in court. Um, but then we realize, oh, there's this unintended consequence that actually complicates what's what's appropriate legally, you know, creates this psychological problem for kids. I think what we, the only thing that we can do is to do whatever we can to make the child feel as safe as they can in that particular context. Asking them what they want. Um, finding other ways to do it by phone, by Zoom, um, having other people with them um, so that they know that nothing can happen. You know, having them, you know, um, have the power to discontinue the visitation if it's making them feel uncomfortable. Um, anything we can do to let the child be an ally in that decision-making. Um, and I think that empowers them and that's activating a different set of psychological responses than feeling totally out of control and being forced into a situation. Um, but you're, you got to follow the law. Um, but any ways that we can kind of nuance this to help people, help kids feel safe. And I like to do it by just saying, okay, we're in this situation. You've said you don't want to see your mom. <laughs> You know, we the law says that I've got to give you an opportunity to visit. I don't want you to like regret not seeing her. However, you know, maybe there's a way we can do this where it's not as difficult for you. And so, like, what would make you feel safest? Who would be with you? Because we can always keep people in the room. As far as I know, there's nothing that law says that that can't be supervised. Um, so uh, just trying to create a condition that increases safety and then asking the kid, what is it about this situation that's most upsetting to you? And maybe they'll tell you and maybe they won't. Um, but a lot of times it has to do with, you know, worry about what's going to be said to them or are they going to be threatened or just just see <laughs> seeing their parent um, and all that's going to mean for them in terms of intrusive memories and that type of thing later. I also think this is a really important opportunity for judicial and court and social worker and uh, child welfare worker leadership. Most of these laws were passed before most of us, most people were aware of the extent of familial trafficking. It's worth starting that conversation in communities and trying to come up with some kinds of um, solutions that serve the children that we're supposed to be serving. And so, uh, you know, I think that if you have uh, any kind of task forces or groups, or you can start one to begin this conversation, it's worth doing because you know, and that includes with legislators, if that's something you can do in your areas. It's just, uh, we didn't know about this when those laws were passed, or at least most of us didn't. And certainly legislators didn't. Yeah, I see some other questions in the Q&A um, about why is there reluctance to acknowledge familial sex trafficking? Um, and you know what? <laughs> It's like everything else. We don't like sad stuff. We don't like to think about things that um, we find horrifying. Um, and I do think that politically and maybe even, you know, from like a socio-legal perspective, that this really gets into parents' rights versus child rights kinds of discussions and people's perspectives um, that, People feel like if you start talking about families hurting your child, their children, they get very defensive sometimes. They they say things like that's none of your business. Um, you know, it happened to me and it wasn't so bad or whatever. I think there's a defensiveness in some, you know, pockets of our culture about that. I think it's also about um, cultural norms and people just, you know, being very insular. 
about, you know, what goes on in the family should stay in the family. I, I feel like we bump up against that a lot. Um, I don't think people can like take themselves off mute and talk, but if you have something to say about that, I'd love to see it in the chat. Um, I, I also think that there is huge denial about this issue because most parents cannot imagine another parent selling a child. So when you talk about it, you know, th there's this, what? <laughs> that goes on in our society. I think, I think people have a hard time coming to grips with the fact that it even happens. Right. Or I get, oh, oh, I don't, oh, that's terrible. I don't know how you even sleep at night. You know, like just wanting to push it away. Um, I think maybe that's human nature. Um, and I think it's also a little bit of, um, I guess I've even had professionals say to me, it is a high impact, low frequency event. And so I don't need to put my attention to it. Um, and so there's that perspective as well, I think. Thank you. Uh, yes, there are. I see comments here from a prosecutor uh, who understands how hard it is to get people to believe it. Um, there is racism and classism and all sorts of other isms. When dealing with all of these issues, we know that um, targeted communities are those who are most marginalized, um, either economically or in other ways. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's also a little bit of like the taboo about sex because you're talking about sex and some people are just uncomfortable with that. They don't want to, they don't have a, that conversation with you about it. Um, and so I think there's a little bit of that, you know, kind of reluctance to engage in, you know, that because of the topic. Um, and I do, I do agree with these, um, the kind of the racism and, and all the isms that relate to sexual orientation and gender and, and that type of thing. Um, I talked a little bit about, you know, the, the issue with boys. Um, but I think also, um, you know, this issue of LGBTQ um, youth being on the streets and how that's overlapping with the homeless um, situation and the vulnerability of these kids. I think that is a problem that people don't want to talk about either. Um, and certainly these are some of the most vulnerable kids, you know, hands down. They don't have anybody to protect them. It's, it's not necessarily familial sex trafficking, but what happened in the family, you know, led them to be on the streets and to be increase their risk, that rejection. There was uh, one question we didn't get to. That is, if you're familiar with it, do you have a perspective on New York State's Stop Violence and the Sex Trades Act? I don't know about this enough to talk about it. So I would love um, to know about that. I wish Chris could talk about it. Do you know about this, Judge Mac? No, I do not. And, and the, in, in answer to other questions, the resources are listed on the slides and the slides will be available as part of the webinar online. Yes. Well, you have all been an active, involved uh, group of participants uh, and there have been a lot of you. So thank you very much for participating. Um, thank you for uh, Dr. Sprang for the incredible wealth of information you've provided and the work you do. Uh, yes, this was recorded and the webinar recorded with the slides will be available. All right. Thank you. Dr. Thank you very Sprang. much. Yes, and thank you. Sprang.